Thank you, everyone. And thank you for the great opportunity to address this topic that is it's certainly a topic of the youth and the topic of the, of the future and, and today. So basically what we are seeing in the, in the labor market of today is that digital solutions, applications, and the IT is changing the working and the labor market very drastically all the time. It's full of amazing opportunities. It's full of potential for growth. But it's also possible that this, this change, this digitalization, is creating new kind of inequalities in the forms of, of social dumping. For example, it's very typical that, that in the new platform um, economy and platform-based jobs, such as Uber or, or food delivery um, applications, uh, actually what used to be normal working contract is replaced with something that is more like a contractor. And this is something that can exclude the people who are actually doing the work from their traditional um, social security, social protection, and their, their traditional workers' rights that we have also been, been fighting for in this, in this movement for, for years now. So the aim of this panel um, is to know the answers, like how can we how can we protect the workers' rights in this transition uh, for the new new kind of digital uh, economy and, and employment? So, to address this question, I would like like to ask the panelists now to start with uh, with a little bit of of opening comments about it. What do you think? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the floor. Uh, as you mentioned, yes, the changes are, are already there. So our labor markets are changing and the youth, the younger generation are those who are affected the most by those changes. And the fact is that I think that no change is bad or good per se. It's up to us uh, to regulate those changes in the direction that they become an opportunity in the sense that we should change our social security schemes to offer to those new kind of uh, job opportunities, uh, social security that is used to for all previous or the traditional kind of employment relationships. So I think it's up to the, um, to the states to regulate this new kind of uh, job opportunities on the labor market to, be as, uh, to offer social security as we are used to. On the other side, I think it's also important that those jobs offer economic security, meaning uh, minimum wage, and also that we discuss about legal security. So to offer the whole package, which is the most important part, so social, economic, and legal security, that we can talk about decent quality jobs. So um, it's up to us, to states, but, and it's really important to say but, we should be honest that because we are living in a globalized world that cannot be issue or it cannot be solved properly and mo most effectively on the national level. And we should discuss this uh, within the EU, because otherwise we compete between states, as we do now at the moment, and causing social dumping because we compete on uh, intern our internal market, with especially with the costs of labor, and we produce uh, social dumping within the EU. So in this respect, it's really important that we discuss these standards, uh, this uh, how to assure uh, quality jobs on the EU level uh, so that um, those new opportunities really become uh, uh, opportunities for all and not to make some generation out of, the, out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Luca, Mr. Vicentini, what are your thoughts on the issue? Yeah, first of all, what you said at the beginning, the opportunities. I think uh, there are a lot of positive effects that come uh, from uh, digitalization, automation in the production processes, and so on. Uh, they potentially, as Anya said, is not a per se positive effect, but potentially these changes that are happening in the economy, in the delivering of services, uh, in uh, providing people with uh, innovative tools, I mean, all these can really improve the life of people. 
uh, can be make a, a, a relevant difference. I mean, in having more quality uh, in, in our lives, uh, as it can also help in. Uh, increasing the level of productivity and competitiveness of our companies, of course. So in this respect, there are some potential uh, positive effects uh, that we should be able, I mean, to boost, to emphasize, and also to manage with a, a better governance, I would say, in the economy, but also in the, in the political arena, because it's also important uh, with kind, which kind of uh, uh, public policy accompanies this kind, uh, this kind of changes in the economy. But having said that, uh, when, when we come to the issue, if these changes are boosting economic growth and particularly job creation, well, on this I'm not completely sure. It depends on a lot of factors. Because you can see that, uh, okay, in the digital arena, for example, there are for sure some jobs created, but are they good jobs? Are they protected? Are they uh, for people that can really earn an adequate remuneration? A big question mark. And on the other side, when automation comes into the companies, uh, into the uh, traditional economic sectors, uh, what we have seen so far is that in most of the cases, uh, automation creates job destruction even more than job creation. So the first problem that I think uh, not only the businesses and the economy, uh, the economic actors, but also the social partners and the public authorities should take care of, uh, is how we can make sure that the opportunities can be really translated into job creation and quality job creation. And to do that, there are at least a couple of things that should be made. The first one is that we need a, a lot of investment. It's impossible to manage this phenomena uh, through cheap labor, uh, unfair competition, uh, no uh, downward spiral in terms of dumping, all these cannot live together with innovation. Innovation should be accompanied by uh, a more progressive and far-reaching uh, public policy, uh, institutional and legal initiatives, uh, and at the same time, of course, uh, the need for making sure that the profits that are coming out of these changes in the economy are reinvested in the economy, and not only in speculation or in the pockets of the investors, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et what we have seen so far in Europe, unfortunately, in the last decade, is that investment, public and private investment, simply collapsed. There was no increase at all, but at the same time there was an incredible increase in profits. Where did these profits go? Well, this is a very interesting question mark we should reflect upon. Uh, the other element in terms of macroeconomic policy to accompany this phenomena is uh, what about taxation? You know, this is a very tricky discussion at the moment because of the Irish case, etc., etc. But you know, how to make sure we can uh, we can, we can ensure that the companies that are operating in the digital economy pay the same taxes as the others, no more than, the, no more than this, I mean, simply the same taxes as the others, and in this way they can also support public budgets, uh, they can also fill into specific funds that can be used for just, just transition in the transformation in these economies. So this is really important. On the one side, investment, on the other side, taxation. And finally, last but not least, what about protection? What about protection? How to make sure that the jobs that exist in the digital economy, the jobs that can derive from automation, are good jobs. So in a way that people, regardless of their labor conditions, uh, they can be employees, they can be self-employed, they can be uh, independent. Uh, sometimes they are both self-employed, they are forced to be self-employed, but in other cases, uh, they are willing to stay independent. I mean, there is a willingness to be independent workers in the digital economy, and this is right. I mean, uh, everybody should be able let's say, to realize their own expectation uh, in terms of uh, uh, competences, skills, and the type of work they want to perform. The problem is to make sure that regardless of the working condition, each and every of these workers can enjoy the same level of protection. And protection is made out of three things. The first thing is rights. Making sure that the working conditions and rights uh, in the workplace, or even if a workplace doesn't exist, these rights can be enjoyed at the same level of quality and quantity by everybody. The second element is to make sure that all these people, regardless of their labor condition, can enjoy the same level of social protection. That means that at the end of their career, they will get a pension. 
a decent pension that at the end of their career or when they become unemployed, they can have a good unemployment benefit or they can have a proper paternity or maternity leave uh, benefits, etc., etc. All this at the moment is not available for at least one third of the labor market in Europe, as an average, I mean. And so we have a problem with that. And the third element that is linked to the other two is that you cannot enjoy proper rights and you cannot enjoy a proper access to social protection if you don't have a decent remuneration. Because even if we increase the level of social contribution to 30% for everybody, for example, or even if we have exactly the same working conditions, but then there is a very skilled young worker that works in an online platform that enjoys only a salary of 200 euros per month, well, this is simply theoretical rights, but it's not rights that can be enforced in the reality. So rights, social protection, and salaries, adequate remuneration, are really the three elements of the triangle. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a good deal when it comes to the digital economy and to auto automation. And of course, this is made out, first of all, of public policy and legislation. There is a discussion going on at the, at the moment at the European level in the framework of the European Pillar of Social Rights to push for a couple of directives that should address this problem. But you know, the role that all of us, starting with the governments, the ministers that are here close to me, I mean, uh, what all of us can do, I mean, to make sure that we simply don't have a, piece, a good piece of legislation that is already a good result, you know, in the current environment in the European Union. But okay, let's say that we can achieve a very good piece of legislation for the future. Well, then the problem is how we enforce it, how we transpose it into the national legislation, how we make sure that we can match a good piece of legislation with investment, with, as I said, good taxation, uh, funds for just transition, etc., etc. It's a comprehensive approach, what we need to make sure that we, have, we can have a good governance of the digital economy for the future, I think. Thank you. And then the uh, remarks of the Minister Schmidt. Thank you very much. Well, a few, a few days ago we had a digital summit. And uh, it's right to, to have organized a digital summit, but this summit was very much focusing on uh, creating a digital single market, which is still very okay, very right. Because Europe needs a digital single market. Europe needs to develop its digital capacities because that is the, the uh, growth motor, the growth engine of the future. There is no debate. But... It's not enough to discuss about digital single markets. We have to uh, take into account different other aspects, which can only be regulated, organized at the European level, at least at the European level, I would say, probably even at a, a, a more a broader level. And here I think, because we are social democrats, I think we have to make clear, everybody says, well, what, what is social democracy still uh, why do we need social democracy still? Well, I think our historical mission was to uh, change the first and even the second industrial revolution and to make sure that things went a bit more just in this revolutions, that we were those who brought up a lot of people working under very difficult conditions. And though, therefore, now we are, as, as you both explained, in a new situation where this technological revolution is producing winners, not so many winners, and also losers, and sometimes many losers. And I just, if you allow me, I would read you a, a very short uh, text was written by, not a social democrat, but by one of the, the biggest experts on the digital revolution, an American professor in, at the MIT, who wrote a, a, a book, there are two, on the uh, second machine age. And he said, well, there's a kind of dirty secret in economics that not many people recognize. While technology can grow the economy, the economic pie, there is no economic law that says that everyone's going to benefit from those technological gains. It could be 50% or more of people who don't share in those benefits. And the data suggests 
that in the past 10 to 15 years, that has been the pattern that has been emerging. Technologi technology has been making the pie bigger, but most of those benefits have been accruing to, uh, to a relatively small group. And this is the issue. This is fair growth. What are we doing about fair growth? And this growth will come out of the digital economy, largely at least. So I think the question is not only a question of production, certainly very important, how do we produce in growth through uh, emphasizing the digital sector, but at the end it will also be about distribution of the gains, of the productivity gains, about the huge amounts of capital which are now with the GAFA companies and therefore taxation. I agree, though sometimes I do not agree with everybody in my own government. I, am, I have a strong feeling we have to sort out the taxation of the GAFA. Certainly, this is absolutely indispensable. Why? Because if we do not tax correctly, it will be the end of the uh, welfare state, because who will bear, finally, the financing of the welfare state? And it will be uh, uh, a situation of unfair competition uh, worldwide. So I think this issue about taxation is, is an issue which is very important and which should be sorted out now, with the American administration, it might be a bit more difficult, at, uh, for instance, at the OECD level. So, when we, talk about, when we are talking about fair growth, about inclus inclusive growth, we have to take this into account. We have to make sure what uh, Luca said, well, what, what is the welfare state in the digital age? How can we reorganize the welfare state in the digital age? How can we finance the welfare state in the digital age? And second, what will be the labor rights, the, working, the, the rights of those who are working in the, uh, in the digital age? And here I think there is some uh, large room now, now, not in the next 10 years, but now also for the commission to come up with very concrete proposals because we are not expecting the digital age. We are already in the digital age. So we have really to work on labor rights, working time, who is, a lab who is an independent worker and who is a, uh, still a wage uh, earner. And the, the borders between both are more and more confusing and, and changing. All these issues have to be sorted out and we need not at national level. We know all the case of Uber. Well, every country has tried to find a solution to the Uber case, including American states. So, but we need here at least a European guideline, a European uh, solution to, this, uh, to these cases. And I think this is something very important for our political family, to come up with ideas, concepts, and also proposals to uh, make this digital age a success as somebody said, not for the few, but for the many. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting and very important points of view from, from all of our great speakers. So I was thinking that maybe we can move straight on for a dialogue with the audience. Do we have some questions that are coming up? Well, if I, well there is one, please. Yes, uh, hello, a question for a panel. Uh, as a PhD student in Bulgaria, I more and more often see uh, the, the inclination of the younger audience away from the traditional 40-hour working week and the values of, let's say, previous generations. So I was just wondering, uh, thank you for the, for the great opening statements, but what would be the more practical mechanisms of ensuring uh, freelance workers, part-time uh, jobs going forward, how would they be protected uh, for their pensions, for their uh, health, care, uh, health insurance as well, uh, maternity leave and so on and so forth? What, what mechanisms are being discussed on how they can get the equal level of protection as standard blue-collar blue jobs? Thank you. Thank you. Is there another question maybe we can collect to you at the same time? Yes, there. You have the, there is a, you have to pull up the, the arm of your chair and there is a microphone inside. There you go. Yes, it's very modern. <laughs> the 
QCD since 2008 are studying this matter. And uh, even now, Ford Foundation are inclusive studying the same, the same, the same matter. I, I, I wanted to know what is your opinion about the role of municipalities and mayors in inclusive growth. What can we do? I am a mayor of a city in Portugal. What can we do to put inclusive growth in action? Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's have one more question over there. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. I would like to ask uh, the panel, what's your opinion about uh, basic income as a tool to, to protect not workers, but the losers of the digital era revolution? Thank you very much. I, I think we can have a small round of answers for, for these three great questions. Shall we start from the Mr. Schmidt? Yes, thank you. The practical sides, I think, uh, that's the reinv to reinvent the welfare state for the digital age. First, I think we have to establish some guarantees for the platform workers, the crowd workers, the independence, the real independence, the bogus independence, all these different categories. And here I think the idea which was launched by the report uh, in the European Parliament by our friend uh, Maria um, Rodriguez, was to, to create some general over, overall or uh, pro social protection. I think every worker, whatever the statute of the worker, ha has, to ha has to get some basic social protection. I think this is important. Now, this protection has to be financed. How will it be financed? Therefore, the taxation question is so important. More, probably also by some contribution, because now I, I know that a lot of young crowd workers or independent workers, they are working and they find it quite attractive to be very independent, having very flexible working conditions. But the day they uh, will be sick or the day they, and unfortunately it will come, they will be a bit older and they have no pension or they have just the minimum of minimum pension which is guaranteed, uh, then they will, uh, they will be in trouble. So I think we have to make clear that we have to build up some basic, fundamental, overall social protection for everybody, first. Uh, second, the basic income. I am not a fanatic of the basic income uh, approach because I think um, it's a bit too easy to say, well, the losers, they get just the minimum and then they, uh, they, have, to be, uh, they have to be quiet. So I think we are still work in a, in, a, in a society where work is important because through work you get not only some of your dignity, at least you should, and also some social relation, social uh, uh, integration. And therefore I think it's, it's important to invent a, a, a society where work still is needed and work will be needed. Absolutely. Maybe the jobs will not be created alone by, by the uh, internet or the GAFA. They may be uh, created, and that's part of the response to our friend the mayor uh, of the Portuguese uh, city. It has to be created in the collectivities, in the towns, in the villages, because there are a lot of social needs there. And so we have to create jobs there because we have an aging society, we have a, a society where, have to, where we have to take care of the kids, where we have to build up social or cultural uh, uh, dimensions and so on. So we have to reinvent the work, the labor, all kinds of new jobs. And this is the answer. It's not the, the answer is not just creating a universal income, even for those who are earning millions. No, that's not the reason. That's not the solution. But we have to take care of everybody and to take everybody along. Ah, yeah, you have one. <laughs> <laughs> So first, what to do for freelancers in practice? Uh, as I said before, 
I think the first problem is to make sure that uh, uh, freelancers and self-employed people, not only the digital economy, by the way, also in very traditional economy, media, for example, or no other kind of, they have a good remuneration. Wages are the first step, because even if we manage, in the current discussion, I mean to have two fantastic directives at the European level that are under discussion, by the way. The first, to extend the same rights also to freelancers, uh, as for normal employees, I mean also to freelancers, self-employed people, etc. And on the other side, we managed to have another directive that says uh, each and every worker, regardless of the condition, will have universal access to social protection systems. Fantastic. But I repeat, if you don't have a good salary, well, it's bullshit, sorry for saying that. It's really bullshit. You don't have real access to rights. It's simply and only a theoretical statement in a piece of law that doesn't make any real difference for people. And what can we do then to ensure that also freelancers that are not typical workers, I mean, can be defined as workers and so that they can have access to minimum wage coverage or and or to collective agreements? Because, you know, the only two tools we have in our hands to make sure that people can earn a decent wage is to have access to the coverage of minimum wages and particularly to collective agreements. In the eastern countries, by the way, this is a bigger problem than for freelancers. It's a problem for everybody because, okay, there is a trend at the moment, fortunately, a push coming even from governments, I mean, to increase minimum wages significantly. Even in Bulgaria, that is the lowest in the scale, I mean, and minimum wages are ridiculous, simply ridiculous, and there is an incredible unfairness in the real situation that you can find in that country. But nevertheless, okay, the government is increasing minimum wages by 20% one year, 20% another year, etc. Uh, there is a very interesting study made by our Czech Republic uh, uh, trade unions that says that at the current path of, incre of wage increases in, in, in Czech Republic, uh, it will take 366 years to get to, to the same level of Germany in terms of salaries. Okay, it's clear that this is our problem. We have to make sure that uh, 366 years become, let's say, 3.6, uh, not le less than 10, I will say, less than 10 to have a decent wage convergence. But okay, despite of these difficulties, the point is that we need to make sure that on the one side, minimum wages are increased properly, and they can cover also self-employed workers, and second, that we can properly establish real and efficient industrial relations and collective bargaining in countries where it doesn't exist. And you know, unfortunately, after the austerity measures, the, the majority of the European member states don't have a proper collective bargaining. And so making sure that we have collective bargaining everywhere and that collective agreements can cover also atypical workers, this is really the fundamental basis for each and every policy we can put in place to make sure that we can in improve the working conditions of these people. Because then, if you can get a decent salary, or if you don't want to call it salary because it's for atypical workers, let's call it a remuneration, if you can make sure that you can get a decent remuneration, then you can have a proper social contribution, you can accumulate money for your pension, you can have a proper unemployment benefit, you can have maternity and paternity leave, etc., etc. But you know, without wage, all this is simply public assistance. And we know that the public budgets don't have the money in there to provide this kind of public assistance to everybody. So it's fundamental to reverse the circle, I mean, no, in, the right, in the right direction. That is, first, ensure better wages. And then from that, you can get better rights and better social protection. When it comes to the minimum income, well, I fully agree with Nicholas, you know. Uh, there are some uh, futurologists, as they call themselves, in, in the US in particular, that say, okay, uh, since in 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, uh, digital economy, digitalization, automation will destroy 50% of our current jobs. And it will be impossible to replace them with other jobs. So it means that everybody should uh, work part-time, 50%, or that only 50% of the working population will work. And all the others will be assisted by the public assistance. That's why we have to tax the robots to introduce a minimum basic impo income for everybody. Well, I hope this will never happen, you know. This will be a nightmare. Because as, as Nicola said, labor, work is still a value. But having said that, and having said that we need, first of all, to create more jobs and jobs for everybody, quality jobs for everybody, then we have a problem, we know. 
in some transition cases or in some macroeconomic shocks that creates enormous levels of unemployment, we have a problem how to help the people that should temporarily stay in that condition, but they need some help. And so in this case, a very well-targeted system for minimum income that should be linked also to active labor market policies for just transition to the labor market, this is something, in my opinion, on which we should reflect. But making sure it is not only and simply a passive measure, it's something that stimulates job creation and re-entering people into the labor market with a better job than in the past. Finally, on the local authorities, uh, I personally think that the local authorities can do incredible things to boost economic growth if they are allowed to do so. And at the moment, unfortunately, because of the stability and growth pact, they are not allowed to invest any money in their local economy. So we need flexibility in the stability and growth pact, not only for member states. We need it, first of all, for the local authorities to make sure they can have some money to invest in the economy to boost economic growth in the local dimension because we know that when you boost economic growth in the local dimension, you do it in a more cohesive and socially fair way. Then having a, a, a top-down approach, I mean, coming from national plans or from European plans for investment, having plans that are tailor-made for the local dimension is always better than having something top-down. So first of all, allow local authorities to invest, and second, allow local authorities to manage just transition. That means that if you have a mine in your town, if you have a steel plant, a steel production plant in your town, or if you have a digital economy company in your town or a, or a district or a cluster, I mean, uh, you need to make sure that the local authorities are enabled together with social partners uh, to manage the transition from jobs that are destroyed to jobs that can be created. And the only way to do this is to give tools to do so to the local authorities. Financial tools, but also governance tools. This is just transition for us, and we really think that, uh, well, the local authorities should be the first actor together with the social partners in managing all this. It's difficult to add something to what all you said about it. But, uh, for example, uh, regarding social security, how to secure different kind of jobs there are, uh, on la our labor markets. For example, in Slovenia, we, we introduced that each job counts. So from each different kind of work that you are paid, you should pay social contributions so that you, even if you are working under a civil contract or whatever kind of contract, you have to pay and also your employer or those who are offering you a job or some kind of work you are performing for, even for student work, for example, you have to pay social contribution. So, for example, student work in Slovenia, um, they, uh, on average, a, a student produced three months of pension record in one year because they are paid out of social, con they are paying also social contribution. It's not the same, and I agree that it's difficult that um, if you are not speaking about the level of remuneration, then it's difficult to, to, to say, okay, you are paying social contribution, but at the end it won't be enough for securing a decent pension. But nevertheless, we should go in that direction. Also, that each kind of work you are performed, you should be guaranteed social security. You, so I mean that there are social rights, you should be guaranteed basic or we have to discuss what are certain legal rights, uh, workers' rights, and also what kind of economic remuneration, economic safety you must be safeguard, because we as a society, we should make a decision if we say, okay, we, we can have part-time work, we can have, for example, um, minimum jobs, is that the, the way we want to proceed or we will fight for a decent work? So meaning that each worker performing this kind of job, we have we will have guaranteed a certain decent kind of work. If we don't make a, find a solution for our um, labor markets offering uh, social security for all they work, so if we want um, Rechange or reinvent our welfare states. At the end, we will end up with the discussion of uh, universal income, because 
if we won't find a solution for a young generation entering the labor market just working without any social security, at the end, there will be no way out. So I agree that we have to stick on a work as the value, as the basis of European social model, and try to make functioning this model not to end up at the end with the only solution that will be at the end basic security because otherwise we will have so so huge conflicts within the eu with the segmentation on the labor market with the unfair uh, unfair society that at the end there will be no uh, no uh, other chance so i'm really trying to make um, to find a solution that the, our, the, the work will offer social security, legal security, and economic security to all the workers. And I think that's really important that we also address the issue of not only social security or economic security, but the need to invest in people in the sense that each worker have a possibility to rescale, upscale, and to, to scale during the all working time because the change is uh, it's really uh, something that's going on and it won't stop so we need to offer all workers uh, the right to be rescaled to be uh, actually uh, give them an option to compete for their uh, for uh, on the labor market i think that's really important for the younger for all uh, workers at the moment Thank you very much. It is indeed a very interesting topic that apparently raises a lot of a lot of thoughts of, and thank you so much for the for your contributions. Even though however interesting the topic is, we only have a limited time for this discussion, even though I'm sure that we will all continue in, in, in our own own countries and in our own movements. But now I would like to ask the panelists like if you would like to raise one last remark when you've listened to each other you've listened to the audience and and, and listen to this discussion uh what would be your closing remark what is the most important thing for the for our movement to raise in this discussion we shall start with the trade union point of view well i think that after we will have proclaimed the European pillar of social rights, and the ministers here are committed to do so, I mean, in a few days. But after that, I think we need really to put, uh, let's say, as the top priority, how to protect uh, workers, and particularly young workers, in the new economy. This is really, I think, the emergency uh, in our European, but even at the global level in the labor market. What we can do, I mean, to protect them, and what we can do also to boost a process for wage convergence between East and West, South and North in the European Union. If we continue with this fragmentation, with this divide that exists between wages, but also working conditions, etc., between sectors and between countries, well, the European Union will never be a Europe that protects, as Mr. Juncker said in his first speech in front of the Parliament when he was nominated President of the Commission. A Europe that protects is, first of all, a Europe that gives the same equal conditions to everybody. And so this is really, I think, the, the key priority. And it has also some economic consequences. Having equality in the labor market, in living and working conditions, means, means also having a better performing economy. Go to Dr. Uh, Kopacz Mrak. Uh, thank you. I think that um, we need more regulation than was we used to have. So we, we need to discuss on the national level, but not only on the national, but the EU level to have more regulation. In the sense, the subsidiarity principle, which is often uh, explained among our ministers that we don't have competencies because the subsidiarity principle it says, says okay the EU competencies are we need less Europe you should govern those social issues on the municipality level and the national level but I think that to to tackle those issues we we need more Europe more than less so we we should struggle for our european social model in the sense that 
no competition on respect on social on um, workers rights and we we should really go forward for the uh, safeguarding these basic principles uh, regarding the legal economic and social rights of workers within the eu as a whole so i agree with both and i would add one issue i think we are heading for or we are already in a knowledge economy and therefore i think and Anya has already mentioned it. Skills, education, reskilling, upskilling, that's extremely important. And I think this is linked to uh, the mobility in our society. If we are in a society where inequality is increasing, it will ex exclude more and more people from this knowledge economy. And they will not be skilled, and they cannot be upskilled, and being a fair growth means a fair chance of opportunity for everybody. And that's what we stand for. So I think skilling education and opening our education systems to everybody, helping those who are far away from these education systems to come into these education systems and to give them a fair chance to be an actor in this digital economy and not just somebody who is losing out of it. Thank you very much. It's it's really um, been a lot of uh, thought-provoking uh, discussion because now we can see that to wrap it up a little bit, um, we have to include the traditional freelances because sometimes it's actually the same thing. And I can see that that's something that we we all must agree is that the European level of regulation was was certainly something that that was raised up by by plenty of our speakers. And as well, uh, the idea of, of the work as a basic uh, thing in, in, in people's life and, and as an opposing to, to something that's just the minimum security. And the idea that the, that the being part of working life is, is not just something that brings you income and social security, but it's also, also part of, of people's life that brings, brings meaning for them. And this is why, why our, our vision obviously has to in the future as well be that, that we want quality quality work. And the point of about the collective agreements is also also very interesting and, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion continuing in the future. Like how can how can we really uh, implement the collective agreement system in, in such a change? Uh, but I, I'm sure that we we obviously have a lot of knowledge about this. And and also the the every job counts uh, point of view. Uh, must certainly be be emphasized because because that's that's it. Like because in in many cases when the new jobs are found, especially for the young generation, it's something that that is not traditional out of its form, but it's still work. Like if you are a delivery boy uh, for for Uber Eats, it's work. It's same as the traditional work, but then you have been put into this this kind of um, uh, box of a contractor even though you don't really want to be an entrepreneur. If you want to be the entrepreneur, you, you will do something else, not, not deliver Uber Eats. So thank you, everybody, for these amazing um, comments and, and your thoughts. And it's really been an interesting discussion. And I'm looking forward to our movement to continue it in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like again uh, to thank all the speakers for this interesting debate. I have to say that uh, before this uh, debate today, we had done some kind of homework a uh, few weeks before, and the PES has published a report on workers' rights and the social progress in the digital economy. So we have been distributing all the paper versions. <laughs> there are no paper version any longer. But if you want, you have different possibility. Either you can download it on the PS website. Two, you can leave your email address and we send you the link <laughs> to, the to, the, to, the, to the report. Uh, you send that, uh, you give it to the reception. And if you really want to have a paper version, you just give us your postal address to the reception there, to our colleagues over there, and then we will send you a, a paper copy if you would like to have a paper copy of this, I think, very good report. And now we are moving on to the next panel.